there was a time when we thought the sea was a sterile dead zone, empty of disease-causing creatures. But now we know better. The ocean is rife with bacteria, viruses, and parasites. And though the vast majority of these microscopic beasties wouldn't harm a hair on your head, a relative few are known to cause everything from the flu to cancer in those that live below the waves. Like in every corner of the Earth, these microbes play many essential roles, including keeping nature in balance. But that doesn't mean animals won't fight back. Of all the potential pathogens floating around in the soup of the sea, which are the most common? With roughly a billion times more viruses in the ocean than there are stars in the known universe, these minute sacks of genetic material top the list. Then there are the single-celled bacteria. Like viruses, there are a lot of them, but the vast majority of them are harmless and some might even be considered helpful. Parasites, creatures who live in or on their host, feeding off of them, are even more diverse in the ocean than they are on land. And finally, there are fungi, which compared to those on land are hard to spot in the ocean. But it's now clear that they're here, from surface waters to deep sea vents and sediments, they're in the decomposing rot of mangrove forests, and even on corals and in the guts of ocean-dwelling animals. And of all those microbes, what about that minuscule fraction that actually has the potential to cause disease? What havoc can those pathogens wreak? Well, thanks to some of them, many ocean dwellers have come to know illnesses similar to our flus and they can experience relatively minor symptoms, such as congestion and coughs, fatigue, and upset stomachs because of them. But if the viruses are particularly virulent, they can kill, sometimes causing epidemics that wipe out thousands of animals at once. Viruses are also responsible for some marine STDs, like the herpes virus, which is prevalent among California sea lions, but has also been observed in fish, oysters, and bottlenose dolphins. Parasites, on the other hand, can be a literal drag. These little crustaceans are called sea lice, and they spread easily in crowded conditions. They feed on the mucus, skin, and blood of their salmon hosts, and cause bleeding and sores that stress the fish and make them vulnerable to secondary infections. And those secondary infections? often come at the hands of bacteria that take advantage of the animal's weakened state, a fairly common occurrence in fish. And then there's cancer. Various types have been identified in everything from shellfish to sea lions, including some cancers that are contagious, infecting other shellfish, sometimes thousands of miles away. Though we often don't know the root cause of diseases underwater, we do know that marine maladies are on the rise. That's thanks in part to the warming waters of climate change and to disruptive human impacts that stress and imbalance these ecosystems in ways that alter the arrival, speed, and deadliness of ocean pathogens, along with the natural resistance built up by the ocean's inhabitants. And it's not just the sick individuals or infected populations that feel the impact. Their neighbors can, too. Entire ecosystems can be turned upside down, like when populations of sunflower stars were decimated by sea star wasting disease. In the aftermath, urchins, prey no longer held in check, spread like wildfire and in turn laid waste to kelp forests. But don't think that animals passively sit by and suffer in silence. Though ocean dwellers don't make trips to the doctor's office, they can be quite resourceful when it comes to remedies. Infected animals will often behave, smell, 
or look very different from their healthy selves, cueing their neighbors to steer clear. So before they even get sick, many ocean animals reduce their exposure to pathogens by avoiding them in various ways, like fleeing from or quarantining infected individuals, or by removing parasites from their hosts. And once sick, many animals adapt to illness by modifying their behavior in ways that let them put more energy toward fighting off infection. Behaviors like slowing down and becoming lethargic, or minimizing how much food they eat. Food that could feed the invasive pathogens. If they're warm-blooded, ill animals can raise their temperature as a way of priming their immune system and making their bodies less hospitable to pathogens. And even cold-blooded animals with infections can induce what's called a behavioral fever by seeking warmer waters or increasing their movement. And like many of their land-loving neighbors, it's quite possible that some oceanic inhabitants self-medicate to help themselves prevent infection, feel better, or to kill off pathogens. Like some of the bottlenose dolphins that live in the Red Sea, who rub against specific corals and sponges with medicinal properties. It's thought that this might help them ward off or treat certain skin diseases. Even more remarkable are some whales, who despite their large size and long lives, two characteristics that tend to increase the odds of developing cancer, are one of the least likely animals on land or in the sea to develop the disease. It turns out that they evolve tumor-suppressing genes that keep their cancer rates incredibly low. From fish that cough, to jettison parasites from their gills, to viruses that trigger mass die-offs, illness in the ocean can cause anything from mildly annoying symptoms to a lethal dose of disease. Despite swimming through waters full of microbes, creatures of the sea have often found ways to fight off infections and feel better. And that is nothing to sneeze at.